Here we are. This life ain't for everybody. Jack Daniels, thank you for supporting this Life Ain't For Everybody podcast and bringing our listeners, our downloaders, our subscribers, these badass episodes. Enjoy Jack Daniels responsibly. Never allow underage drinking. Y'all know what Jack Daniels is. Number seven, the black label, Tennessee sour mash whiskey. I like it unapologetically. I don't abuse it. Moderation. But man, does it taste good with a Coca-Cola classic, a Coke Zero some soda water, club soda, little maraschino cherry juice, little bitters, cherry on top, maybe an orange peel on there. I like Jack Daniels. It's good. And it's been there for me and my crew for a lot of trips, a lot of good times. It's even there for the sad times. So enjoy it responsibly. And thank you for listening to the podcast. Today's episode of This Life Ain't For Everybody is also brought to y'all And I say y'all because the guy I'm talking to today says y'all and yonder and I reckon and Podna, Podna, Podna. It's brought to you by Gator Coolers, G-A-T-R, capital G, capital A, capital T, capital R, coolers from the great state, the Cajun country of Louisiana. And I'm talking, you want to eat good, you go visit the McGeehee brothers, Mitch, his brother Brian, the founders, the owners of Gator Coolers. I'm proud of my brother Clay and our partnership with Brian and Mitch. They're a badass team. Their whole family is awesome. I've met their lovely wives. They do it right, whether they're fishing, hunting, gatoring, cooking, traegering, gumboing. They get it going on. We're going to start today's podcast by introducing the one and only Brian McGee. If y'all can't understand him, just start clicking on your keyboard. You'll get it. There'll be a bouncing ball soon. What's up, my man? (laughs) Man, what an introduction. I'm like ready to meet this guy. We are meeting you right now. <laughs> now I'm just happy to be here. Me too. On this side of the dirt you mean or on this podcast? Definitely both. It's been yeah. a long uh been a long few months. A long year in Louisiana. Y'all were held down pretty tight from the beginning. Yeah, and then hurricane season comes and adds on. I don't know. We had 125 storms, it feels like. But it's been one thing after the next. But uh, I'm glad that things are back kicking. Yeah, and I see a gator. Is that a real mounted gator on over your left shoulder, my right? That is a real alligator, which is the camera's not wanting to focus on them. But uh, we're not sure what we're going to name him yet. Probably T-Boy or T-Bra or something T. Cause that makes the most sense. Why? Yeah, I, do. I don't know. Cause of the teeth. No, just a, a Cajun nickname type of thing here, but that's a 12 and a half foot alligator. We got full body mounted with, uh, he's standing up holding one of our ice chests with a raccoon tail coming out of it. And, uh, <laughs> can't see it, but there's a, a huge crawfish on the backside of them. And that's what will be, uh, coming to all the trade shows whenever the world unlocks again. Wow. You ought to name him boots. Boots. That's not Cajun, man. That's not. Come on now. That's that sounds. That's 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 a cat on Shrek. That's what they use gators for. Boots. Yeah, but that's a that's a cat on Shrek. You know, you know, it's a perfect name. Y'all can y'all can tell everybody I came up with it. Yeah, boots by Chad. Boots. This is our gator boots. It makes perfect sense, man. That's what you say. These are my gator boots. This is my gator boot. Name him Boot. (laughs) <laughs> yeah we're gonna bring him to all the trade shows and uh instead of hauling around a huge trailer full of coolers and struggling with the boxes and unloading and loading and all that good stuff um we'll just have a real good display of all of our options and what, what we do and uh part of the show deals will be just come and take a picture with the alligator post them on social media and uh we'll ship the cooler to your house right from our warehouse Speaking of options, you got anything new to tell us for 2021 as far as coolers go? Uh, We're definitely working on some new stuff. Um, Man, last year set us back a lot. And I think you set everybody back a lot. You know, you have goals and you're trying to forecast and plan stuff out and make moves to make certain things happen. Nobody can plan on having the coronavirus. And uh, plus, we purchased this warehouse that, that set us back four to six months or so um, trying to get the distillery aspect of it out. You know, they left 30 barrels of whiskey in here that were illegal. So um, we had to do some cleaning up there. 
But so that pushed back a few of the things that we had in the works. And we do have some new uh, new styles of coolers coming out, uh, drinkware. We're still going to roll with a few limited edition uh, colors uh, a couple times throughout the year. But for the most part, um, for the rest of this year, I think it's going to be sticking with our lineup and really focusing on the customizing aspects of it. Did you just admit that a Southern man has 30 illegal barrels of whiskey in his presence? No, not at all. If you're uh, listening, federal government, if you're listening, <laughs> federal government, we do not have any at all. <laughs> does, Actually, the, does the moon ever shine over the Gator Coolers warehouse? Is it shining right now? Man, you know what's awesome about that is uh, some buddies of mine that had uh, Bayou Terrebonne Distillery just opened in Terrebonne Parish, not far from here. Their great grandma or grandma or something like that. Uh, she she was an original moonshiner from back in the day, and we ended up making a deal with them to purchase the barrels that were left here. And it was a whole like I don't know moonshiner feeling, a, a whole coming at night with a big trailer and hauling you know thirty barrels of full whiskey across the parish lines. That was that was a part of the story that goes into that. But um, I definitely. It set us back because the taxes that went along with that, just for me to pour it down the drain or make it disappear, was insane, man. So we had to go about it the right way. It just took a little extra time. But now the warehouse is clear and y'all are doing day-to-day -day business as usual now? Yeah, and um, I think last time we talked, I was in our back warehouse and uh, the front still had all the distillery equipment and it was getting uh, demoed. Now we have all of that stuff out. The equipment's in the back warehouse now. We're set up in the front. We, we completely remodeled the front to have our custom shop. Uh, our CNCs and laser machines are all up here. And we have a, a closed-in area for boats, which we can get into later, but uh, for a, a place for us to scan and to design decking out on people's boats in here. And uh, the back is just a uh, fulfillment center, just a warehouse. So every, every order that comes through our website or any of our dealers, our corporate partners, uh, nonprofit partners, it all gets shipped out of our warehouse right back there. And how big is the overall building and warehouse space, office space? Uh, we just added on a section. I think we're at like 13, five or so. Damn. Can't hide money. Must be moving some coolers. I get you can't hide credit. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that we pay truth. our bills, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, um, it's a big jump from when we met. I think the first time we talked, we were still in Mitch's shed. So uh, we went from Mitch's shed to uh, uh, we rented a storage building on Tiger Drive in, uh, I don't know if that's considered Thibodeau or Shriver still, but uh, we was in one unit of a, a storage unit and we did a ton of business out of that. Uh, grew into the second storage unit. And I, I always loved when people would contact us and say like they're looking for a facility or they'd like to see the manager, of, you know, over marketing or over whatever department. And it's like just two coon asses operating out of a, a storage unit. And then somebody would come and, and want to pick up a cooler locally. And they're like, man, is this, uh, is this where this is happening? Oh, yeah. Sorry to disappoint <laughs> you. <laughs> this is us. But now we have a legitimate place, man. It's a, it's a great, I have one more piece of the puzzle is a, um, a mural getting painted next door in our uh, storefront for the retail space, but that'll be the last piece of our puzzle. And then starting in May, we have uh, two containers a month, every month showing up for cooler. So we'll be stocked up and ready to finish the year strong and, and continue like we should have done halfway through last year. Yeah, last year, I mean, containers on the water were null and void for a minute. It's hard to get anything out of out of that part of the world. Well, we so, couldn't work. We couldn't. Uh, we couldn't do anything until April, May, around June. So that's whenever it, it took about four months, five months or so for us to get legal in this warehouse, and then we could start purchasing inventory. And you know, when you're forecasting and stuff, it's not like going up the street to Walmart and restocking the shelves. You're you're planning out months in advance. So uh, we did, we only got three containers of hard coolers last year where we would have typically done 15 to 20 as uh, what we were scheduled to do. But you know, it is what it is. We survived it. It's, it's uh, we're making it through and uh, we're set up better than we ever have been to, to grow the rest of this year. With that mural, are there, 
other additions to this warehouse, including a gumbo pot. I mean, are y'all cooking gumbo over there? If I come down to the Gator Warehouse and I'm uh, having a meeting, can I expect to have a, a gumbo going or a gravy or something? We have a whole little outdoor cooking area, and uh, we have a little kitchen area that's nothing but counter space. If you know some Kunas is cooking, we need our counter spaces. So a lot of chopping area, a lot of, uh, a lot of space to move your elbows around. But, yeah, we got some Traegers outside, and we got the cast iron stuff outside. And, we got the microwave. So anybody all the way down from, you know, the true experience all the way to the popcorn, guys, we got them covered. <laughs> what is a roux? Now, roux is spelled R-O-U-X. But yeah. there's companies out there that have made it easy to make a so-called gumbo or something that's Cajun. They taste, they could taste okay, right? There's little packets or self-starter kits or stuff like that that can... You can do all right in a pinch, but a real gumbo is an all-day event, correct? The old school way, yeah, but now nobody wants to do that. You know, you like I remember my dad cooking whenever I was little and starting off boiling chickens in the morning to make his own stock. And it just, after that's done, then you're deboning the chicken, shredding it up. You know, now I cheat myself. I buy rotisserie chickens from Rouse's and <laughs> Uh, I debone the rotisserie chicken, gives it extra flavor in there, and then you buy the chicken stock, you know, pre-made. You're not you're not doing it from scratch, but same thing with the roux. There's roux in a jar. And I think there are some little packets that you can kind of dry mix. Um, just depends on, I guess, how, how how much you want to cheat on it. So is roux a gravy? No. It's oil and flour. What's a gravy? I mean, the roux, if, if a gravy to me, you can eat a gravy. You, you're not just going to eat the roux because you're mixing literally like if you're doing a, a standard size gumbo for us is a one to one ratio of oil and flour and then just mixing it down. That's a starter for a lot of different uh, kits for a lot of different meals. So you can't just make a roux and then freeze it and then use that roux for a topper later on down the road. You're going to use it as a base later on down the road. A base later. Yeah. You're not going to eat it. No. So when you're mixing a roux, give I guess me you a, can, you'll be disappointed. You would. <laughs> I said, I guess you could eat it. You'll be disappointed. So you yourself, Brian, you're in your thirties. You're a young Cajun. Can you make a good roux and a good mm -hmm. gumbo? Oh yeah, definitely. Yep. And I think that's um, I think my, my family, my wife, my kids enjoy when I cook, but they don't like how long it takes. Because if for me, it's like, OK, what are we doing Sunday? I want to eat gumbo. And my wife knows. Oh, crap. We got to go to early service at church. Brian's going to be tied up the rest of the day. It's not a it's not a hey, let's get home at two and we'll eat for five type of thing. Because you don't want to go too fast and burn the room and you have a burnt taste in the gumbo. It's, it's a low and slow type of thing. If you're a drinker, you might say it's a six beer roux. By the time you're done with six beers, it's done. Are you a drinker? Uh, sometimes, man, lately, to be honest with you, I've been on uh, a different whiskey kick. What do you mean? Just trying different whiskeys and bourbons and stuff. And, and just, I don't, I don't I hate feeling hung over. I hate that feeling. And I don't drink to get drunk. Um, very, very seldom does that happen. I think the last time I was probably at somebody's house in Reno and barely made it home, but just making one drink and you're good to go, you know, get your little buzz. It stops my mind from going 5,000 miles an hour and just kind of chilling out for a minute. And, uh, I'm good to go with that, but just, just one mixed drink or one just like straight, you know, trying different stuff. So if it's Jack Daniels is your whiskey choice, what are you making tonight to to get that type A personality to slow down a minute? So I, I have a few different uh, single barrel picks from them, and uh, I've just been drinking that just with Ice Cube, man, just kind of sipping on it. Say again, just with Ice Cubes? Yeah. Oh, so you're being a man. You're like, you're, you're. That's not neat, but well, you're see, just... I'm on. Well, well, see, I'm on these bourbon pages, man. And if you mix that with root beer or something, they make fun of me. So I just gotta. 
put an ice cube in there. I even went all out and got the little huge uh, square ice cube trays. So, you know, one cube takes up the whole jar or the whole cup. I have an actual uh, whiskey glass now. I'm almost official. So is this going to be like where the sophistication starts to kick in in your life right now? It's not? No. It's a it's a phase, man. It's, I'll get over it. <laughs> do, you th- do you think that uh, – is it something that you look forward to? Now, I'm being honest with this. I want to know this because when you start to develop <clears throat> the, you know, the desire to have a bourbon or a whiskey, a Jack Daniels in the evening before you, you know, it's after dinner, the kids are down, whatever, it's adult time, whatever, you start to think about this. It becomes part of your daily you know, it's, it's, it holds a place in your heart, Brian, is what I'm trying to say is like this sophistication of being a whiskey drinker and not just a beer drinker is it's different. And you start to look forward to it. Do you find yourself thinking about that evening cocktail during the day? Man, it's weird that you said that. And my wife probably would hate this, but, um, I don't want to like, just get home from work and go straight to it. You know, it's, it's, I would take my time with the kids and play with them and uh, interact with them, make sure they realize that I'm still here, even though I'm working 150 hours a week. Um, do the whole supper thing. We'll do baths, get them in bed. That is definitely something, though, that I, I look forward to. Uh, not every night, but it's it's on my mind a lot more. Like it's I don't know. If, I don't know if it's almost addicting, like an addicting trait or something or addictive trait. But it's like you start to think it's what I imagine someone who like smokes and they start thinking of, man, I need a cigarette right now. It's almost that feeling what I imagine that would be. in life. I guess. See, I think of it more like I don't I think cigarettes are more of a, you have to have it or that be, you could become addicted. Whiskey, I think you can have those thoughts as just it's because of that. It's that sophistication. And you start to think of man, it's, it, it does me right. It it ends my day the right way. It tastes right. It mixes right. It pairs right with the food or whatever, if I choose to do it that way, but I'm the same way. Like, I don't look at it like, Oh my God, I got to have it. I have to go in my closet at noon and chug some Jack Daniels. I think that's crazy. (laughs) And I know it happens and I'm not looking down at the fact that there is a such thing and an issue with addiction in our country and all over the world with alcoholism. But I look at it like, man, when I mix that drink, it makes me feel like, Hey, that's my reward for working my butt off all day you kind of look at it the same yeah i mean it's um my wife doesn't like that i drink she doesn't like when i drink she doesn't want me to spend my time with her a little bit of time that i have uh, drinking i can't blame her uh because whenever i'm drinking it's it's just because i want to relax i'm not worried about the tv i'm not worried about talking about what i did today or you know what shows on or nothing else um but i do look at it kind of like that as just kind of a nightcap way to end it off and slow, slow, to man, slow my mind down. Let me, you know, get to sleep a little faster. So it helps you sleep. Yeah, it does. Definitely. Okay. So if you are, if you are stirring that roux, are you, if you were doing one this weekend, would you hit a cold beer with that roux? Probably not. I, I feel like beer lately since, since I stopped drinking as much beer, it, like I feel so bloated and just like after man, it just, I don't know. It's weird because I can get that same buzz off of one, maybe two drinks of whiskey and I don't have all the extra, I guess, liquid in my body. And I, I don't know if that's right or if that's, if I'm making that up, but I just, I don't feel right <laughs> drinking beer anymore, to be honest with you. So thinking of beer and cold beer, give me an, I give me an idea of what I could tell somebody or Hannah Barron can go tell somebody, or Clay could go tell somebody. As far as retention goes, explain retention to me and tell me some of the tests that you and your brother Mitch have ran. And what can we guarantee? And how do we get that retention? Because there is a process, right, Brian, of making sure that that cooler is set up to retain ice. Definitely. I mean, it's it's a tool that um, if you're not using it right, it's not going to work. I mean, it's, and that's very simple. The most important thing is having it pre-chilled. 
And if you don't have it preached, if, if it's, I don't know what the temperatures are like there over here, it's insane, you know, 100 degrees one day and 30 degrees the next. But when it's really hot and I have my cooler stored in the back of the truck or in my garage or wherever, um, that foam gets hot. So the first bag of ice that you're putting in there is cooling the foam down. It doesn't matter if it's a $50 ice chest or if it's a $5,000 ice chest, water still freezes at 32 degrees. So if the foam is 120 degrees, it's not going to hold ice. <laughs> so the, the most important aspect of it is getting the cooler pre-chill. Um, I really, really, really dislike a lot of the ice retention tests that you see on YouTube. I think that there's way too many variables that go into it. Um, you know, the shape of the cooler, if it's taller than it is wide, if you have like a wider cooler that's not as tall, and there's more surface area that the sun's beaten down, that ice will melt faster than if you have a really tall block of ice that's not as uh, not as wide. Does that make sense? So there, there's a lot more that goes into it than that. Um, the type of ice, which until, until I started doing this stuff with Gator, I never paid attention to that kind of stuff, but the type and quality of ice makes a massive difference too. I just thought ice was ice, but... Um, those hollow cube ice that you'll get out of an ice machine sometimes, they melt really fast. Um, the ice that's on the verge of not being quite melted out of some of those like quick, you know, dollar ice machines, they don't last as long. The solid chunk, um, slow melt, really frozen, that's what lasts longer. Um, thinking about the voids in your cooler, air is really hard to keep cold. So you want to max it out with ice that'll last the longest. Ice to contents ratio. Um, if you stack a cooler full of cans and you have a two inch layer of ice on the top of it, that two inch layer of ice is trying to cool a 45 quarter ice chest with all the cans underneath it. That's, that's not going to last long either. Um, usually we try to do like a 60, 40 to, if we're, if we're going out in the boat and we're just doing a quick day trip, it really doesn't matter. It's going to stay cool anyway. But if you're going to the camp for the week, then you try and do like a 60 to 40 ratio, um, which you don't get to stack as much stuff in your cooler, but the ice is going to last as long as you need it to. And with also that putting in stuff that's not cold. I mean, if you put in, go to the store and you'll see a pallet of water that's sitting outside and you'll grab a, a, a case of that water off the pallet, go and check out where that water's hot. And when you put that in there, the ice is going to try to cool that down as much as you can, which is then melting. I mean, it's very basic stuff there. But people don't think about that kind of stuff. You know, if you go to the cooler, it might be, I don't know how it is around y'all, but some gas stations here might have uh, uh, cases of water that are in their chiller and they might be a dollar more. But if you start off with your contents already cold, the ice will last that much longer too. So on that 60-40 camp trip, are you, do you start with a layer of ice at the bottom and then put cans on top of that or whatever you're putting in your cooler that's chilled down already? Let's assume everything's got a pretty good temperature to start as far as being chilled. I don't, I don't put ice in it first and I'm sure that will help a little bit too, but um, just pre-chilling is the biggest factor in all of that stuff. And pre-chilling could be as, as simple as, you know, bringing the cooler in your house for a day or two before you, you know, you're leaving, you know, instead of having it, a hundred degrees in your shed. It might be, you know, whatever you keep your AC on 72, 68, somewhere in there, uh, typically. And then putting that first sacrificial bag of ice in there, or, um, my parents have some big milk jugs that we froze with water. And instead of just rebuying that bag of ice that you know, you're going to waste, we'll throw the milk jugs in there, let the temperature of the core of the foam get cold, take that out, refreeze the jugs, and then the cooler's good to go. As I look at boots back there behind you, I have to ask if you've ever had gator meat in a gator cooler. Yeah, man. Um, this past season, actually, uh, Skidmark and Benny came and uh, Colin and uh, Colin McMillan and Ben Ratliff. And we loaded down with some meat and actually we cooked one night out there just fresh off of one of the big gators. Uh we cut off one of the loins off the tail and, and Benny grilled them on the Traegers. It was good. Surprisingly, like I, I'm a little reluctant to eat a lot of stuff like that, man. I just had some bad, bad experiences, I think. Um, 
but it was really good. You've had bad experiences with Gator? I've had bad experiences with like everything except for just plain chicken breast. <laughs> like probably one of those little dumb moments growing up and my mom locks us out the house and says, Hey, y'all don't come back till, you know, an hour past when the sun goes down. And we're basically living in the woods behind the house and we're riding my three wheeler and we'll see a mouse we'll jump off, catch the mouse, put it on the hook on a jug line, uh, catch a garfish off of that. And then we're grilling garfish chunks on a grill that we stole out of the dump that we're lighting with wild green onions and palmettos. Like I think to myself, man, we're eating this crap. And mom's house is like right there. We can go get a sandwich at any time, but I just had some weird stomach issues after that. I just, I don't, it's, it's mostly mental for me. Once I get past that mental issue, then it's, uh, we good to go. So do you like a crawfish boil? You don't, do you? I think I remember you telling me you don't like crawfish. I mean, I'll eat it if it's there and, and I, I love having them because it's more of a social thing for me. But as far as like, oh my God, I can't wait for crawfish season. Like I'm not that guy at all. I'll sit there and peel them with everybody. And I like to cook with the crawfish afterwards more than I like, you know, sitting there and actually eating them. We started throwing snow crab legs in the pot. Um, so I'll eat the snow crab legs that night and then we'll use the crawfish to cook different stuff afterwards. Said no Cajun ever that he doesn't like to sit there and peel and eat crawfish. Just me. <laughs> it's not, I mean, it's, I don't know, for a long time, I was the guy there that had the ham sandwich. I mean, it's just, it was, I don't know. It was weird. Is Mitch the same way? We, not at all, man. We, we just, we grew up pretty poor for a little while. So it was whatever we caught or grew or shot is what we ate. And I'm thankful for that season of our life. But I think I got burned out on fish and seafood during that season. But you just said Mitch, not at all. Does he still like to eat the gator and the crawfish and all that? Or is he like you? Oh, no. Mitch will eat anything. And Mitch is a way better cook than I am. He is? Yeah. I mean, dude, my whole adult life, I lived in a camper. Have you ever tried to really cook Cajun shit in a camper? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> is this because that of the oil? I mean, is this because of the oil field? Yeah, yeah. And you're done with that now, yeah. The weirdest feeling in the world, but yeah. Um, is Mitch still it's, out it's there? Been one year so far. Yeah, he actually just took another position with Shell, uh, moving up with them, and uh, he's been working out of Houston a lot lately. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, he's doing really well with that, um, and it's been. I think right out of year for me to be doing Gator full time and not having that, uh, you know, badging in, badging out, lunch pail routine. Do you miss it? I miss the money. <laughs> I miss traveling around. You know, I miss man at, at uh, you know, be from eighteen to thirty years old. I traveled most of the country. I got to see some awesome sites that people you know, never see and meet a lot of people that I never would have met if I'd have just gotten that same rut and routine here, um, doing the offshore thing or shrimp boat type thing that people do here. Um, I'm thankful for that part. And, you know, it grew my network, my personal network a lot. Uh, I have some lifelong friends that I just randomly met along the way, but um, I don't miss watching my kids grow up through a telephone or seeing them, you know, once a month, every three or four months when they come see me and stuff. Do you like Mardi Gras and being in New Orleans? New Orleans, is that how you say it? Not in the all. South, is it New Orleans? I think they say it like Nolans. Nolans, Nolans, Nolans. Yeah, that's you don't what's like, printed on all the stickers anyway. Do you like New Orleans? New Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans, Nolans. Do you like it? Do you like being there for Mardi Gras? Not at all. No. Nope. Really? <laughs> you look disappointed, man. <laughs> I'm not disappointed. I'm just like, you're so, you're just boring, it seems like right now. McGee, like, are you getting too old for me or what? No, I've never been that guy, man. I, I just, I don't know if like in my prior life I was in the military and I have some kind of deal with crowds, man. But at, even at church, sometimes I find myself like looking around, there's way too many people here and, and I don't like it. And, and any, people are so crazy now, you know, there's all the time people getting shot in New Orleans at these parades because you're standing on the wrong block at the wrong time or you scuff somebody's shoe or you caught a bead or they threw a bead too hard. And I just, that's not my scene, man. I just, 
ever since probably right after I hurt my shoulder uh, playing ball and, and I knew that I w- that wasn't my uh, career, I just went to work and I just want to work and, and make stuff better and provide for my family. And I'm not, I've never, I skipped that whole part of my life where you're going out and doing the party and doing the parades and stuff. That's, that's really not my thing. Okay. So that w- when you're at a place like Nashville, it's not like you're sitting idle in a hotel room. You enjoy the, the convention and WTF. There's a lot of people in there. You go, you hang out with me on Broadway. There's a lot of people there. Do you like Nashville because it's more your scene and Mardi Gras is just not your scene? Absolutely. I love Nashville, but I love the, like the music aspect and just the talent that's there and meeting people and stuff like that. But you'll never catch me drunk on the side of the road yelling at somebody on the trailer to throw me a beat. I couldn't give a crap less about that at all. I mean, I go uh, local parades here, bring my kids, you know, they, it's cool for them to see and, and like they enjoy it, but it's, and I think right now too, it's just uh, any given extra hour that I have, I have so much stuff with Gator that I want to do that I could do that. I'm thinking about doing like my mind never gets off of that. I'm, I'm skipping a lot of the fun stuff. I think um, I've just accepted that this is the season of my life where I'm not supposed to have fun. I'm, I'm just working and doing that. When does that season end? When the brand's grown enough to where I have a fleet of people that I can basically go on autopilot. You really think I that think. your mind, you, you think your mind will allow you to go on to autopilot? No, <laughs> but that's what I'm shooting for. I mean, you asked me when it ends and I think that's when it ends. Do I think that that's going to be realistic? No. I mean, I, I don't never want to, I never want to be uh, on autopilot with the brand, with the company, um, or be hands off with any aspect of it. I've enjoyed the hell out of what we do. And, um, you know, to go from basically a, a joke text message between me and my four brothers to where we are four years later, it's, man, I love it. And we didn't reinvent the wheel. We just, you know, just put our own little sauce on it and, uh, just getting involved and in, in what it allows us to do and the people it allows us to help and the organizations it allows us to help. It's amazing just for some, you know, coolers and cups and hats and stuff like that. So I've, I'm, I've become addicted to that part of it. I don't think I, that part will ever turn off. I promise you it won't. I don't, I don't want it to, you know, I think that that's uh, kind of like all those athletes you always hear. I'm like, man, when are you going to hang it up? Well, I guess if I wake up and I just don't want to do it anymore, if I don't have that burn anymore, then I'm, I'm good to go. But I don't see that being a thing for me. No, I don't either. Once you get Gator where you want it, there'll already be something else in the blender that you're trying to mix up. Yeah. When it results of that. Speaking of addiction, have you had one of these? No, I haven't. Oh, Rotisserie. Man. Did I it's say chicken? The- it's the original rotisserie chicken strip. These are new from Jack Links. Look at that. It's just a high protein, low fat bar. Damn it, boy. Never I need to ship those. you I need to ship you some of these. Never seen them. I can I can chew. I'm chewing right now and it's quiet because it's just really good protein, Brian. You working out at all? <laughs> <laughs> can we have a pause uh, for the laughter that's going in right now <laughs> not one bit no uh unloading coolers is about the biggest workout loading them up um man i've been getting my butt whipped lately with the website building um trying to trying to streamline a lot of that stuff with the website we're doing the customer accounts and uh just streamline a lot of the orders and a lot of the um, nonprofit and corporate stuff that we have. There's, there's about three steps that we can cut out and make everything better. I've been just focusing on that and also uh, splitting into a different aspect of Gator, uh, growing the brand into a different branch and been really focused on that. So if I'm up at, you know, four 30, it's, it's because I'm coming to the shop to, to do something else on that early, not to go to the gym. Excuses. Yeah, I, I'm more worried about doing this than uh, getting back my, my six pack. Look, man, you got to have a balance, bro. You got to still take care of yourself. 
Yeah, but you're like 50, right? When did you hit that? When you was at like 42 going downhill, then you started to do back to work. First off, I'm 45. Second off, that's a low <laughs> blow. But huh. working out, that kind of like that whiskey mindset you're talking about, it's therapy. It is, man. I, and I do miss those days. Um, but right now, I mean, I try to make sure that I turn the switch off in afternoons to be with my kids and uh, spend some time with them. I only get a couple hours a day with them. So I, I want to make that count. So I, the only other option is waking up earlier and going to do stuff, you know, earlier while they're sleeping. And um, the working out thing just isn't, it's about probably fifth or sixth on my list right now. It's, I've got a few things above it. Family. Gator. Yep. Yep. What else? Hunting. There's there's aspects in Gator. It's not just Gator. Uh, if you click that folder, there's about four drop downs in there. Things that I need to get done and need to get squared away before. Uh, because I built our website and I, I've done a hundred percent of the media, all of that stuff. So. Um, and that was just, we didn't have, you know, 20, 30, $40,000 to build a custom website. I didn't know anybody to build it and explain to explain to somebody what's in my mind and get it across to get a finished product that I think reflects our brand. I was just spinning my wheels. So I just did it myself, but it, it, it takes a lot of extra time. I get that. I understand that there's a lot of things that go on, but I mean, there, this is the time of your life. You still got to like, I know that you're focused and I know that you're geared towards success and the growth of the brand and the well, health and well-being of your family. But you're saying that when you're in Louisiana, it's literally Gator Shop, the new house, Gator Shop, the new house. There's nothing else that's popping with you. No. And it <laughs> As soon as I wake up in the morning and turn my alarm off, uh, my phone says nine minutes to work. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. I live right up the street uh, from our shop. But it's as soon as I, as soon as I crank my truck up and uh, my phone hooks to my truck, it, it's popping up either going from the shop to my house or from my house to the shop. There's really no, nothing in between. Yeah. And, you're good with this. Like there's nothing like telling you like, man, I'm cause a lot of entrepreneurs, they get so dead set on that end goal and they get so consumed with it that they forget about the balance of everything else. Like you made a comment about the oil field and seeing your kids every three or four months, except on FaceTime or Skype or whatever. Is that kind of how you are right now? That's just, that's all that matters right now is just the, the well being of the family and the brand, nothing else matters like there's nothing that's going to get you out of louisiana to go do right now unless maybe it's a trade show when they come back yeah if it's uh something working or if it's like a quick trip you know we i've done little things um uh, i went to a uh, songwriter retreat at collins place in alabama with a few people uh just like a quick three-day type of thing but that's few and far between man i mean it's there was an instance where my middle child forget how old he was, maybe four at the time. And he just like was so disappointed that I wasn't there whenever they woke up on a Saturday because they went from me being like around all the time to, you know, get back in this work mode. Whenever we went from, we're moving from the back warehouse to now we're moving to the front. There's construction happening. Now we're shifting with the website. We have the, this new product line coming out, which entails more designing, fixing the website adding products, mixing that in with our accounting software, like just so many things that go into it. Um, but just him being upset that I wasn't there one morning, I'm like, man, I, I have to make sure that I, um, and they love doing everything that I do. They want to come to the camp with us. They want to go riding, you know, in the boat or um, they'd like just come into the shop and watch the CNC and the laser run. I mean, it's, they enjoy that kind of stuff. So, for me, this, there's nothing more important during this point in their lives. You know, it's not like they're uh, teenagers going off in the wind there and not wanting to be around me. They, they want to be as, you know, up my butt as I let them and I, I need to let them. 
um, that way they're learning from me right now. So as an entrepreneur, you also have to start thinking about the future. Is this Gator brand something that Mitch and Brian build up and sell? Or do you see these youngins coming up in the ranks and taking it over and making it a generational family business? Man, I don't know what I'm doing next week. So, I mean, it's a easy answer. Brian. Way, to take, way to take the easy answer. Way to take the easy road out of that one. <laughs> Look, I'm going to say, is, just every, like I told is, another is everything, for, is everything for sale, Brian McGee? Everything is for sale for the right price. It is, huh? If I can interest you in a couple employees uh, for the right price, everything is for sale. Hmm. All right. Well, then- I don't say I don't know that it's going to be a generational brand, man. These types of brands to me, and maybe I'm maybe I'm misreading some of this stuff, but these types of brands to me to get to where we should be, to where we can be, to where I know we will be, is uh, it's a very expensive journey. It's a lot of money up front to float. So I know that with that comes uh, taking on investors, comes you know different ways of splitting up your equity in the company. So I don't see myself being a hundred percent out, but is it, is it something that, um, you know, takes the kids through their life? No, I'm, I, I think that even if we are at a stage where they could, I'm still wanting them to be independent and earn a spot here. They, they won't have a spot just because of who they are. I understand that makes sense. So, Part of you is saying that they got to earn a spot there just because they're the owner's sons doesn't mean that they're going to come up and just become the CEO or the GM or whatever one day. But are you also yeah. saying in so many words that you don't want to make their minds up for them and you want them to stay open minded on what they also want to do is for an education, Definitely. secondary education in a career? Definitely. Yeah, 100 percent. I I don't want to. Uh, my parents did that for me. You know, they didn't force a sport on me. They didn't force uh, certain schools on me. They, they let me do what I wanted to do for the most part. And I grad, gravitated to baseball and that became my world until I hurt my shoulder. And then, I mean, I, I kind of made my own decisions with work and school and which, which routes I wanted to go. I don't want my kids to do the same thing. You know, I'll be there to support them and kind of guide them, but I don't want to tell them, you know, kind of like this prearranged marriage deal. Like, no, here's what's going to happen. You're going to you're going to run this company. So you need to do this, this, and this. That's, I don't feel like those deals work out well a lot. Would you give up your ownership in Gator for one full season in the big leagues, starting shortstop for the Atlanta Braves, Brian McGee, hitting, hitting number three in the lineup? Nope. No. Nope. Mm-hmm. Would you give it up? to be the starting quarterback at LSU for your junior season before you enter the NFL draft? Not at all. Really? Mm-mm. Hmm. What am I going to do after that? I don't know. This has been fun, man. This is, this has been fun. It's stressful as hell. Uh, I have no clue about business. I'm learning a lot, <laughs> but it's been really fun. It's, it's, I mean, to, the people we met, the stuff we got to do, the um, if Gator ever weren't a thing in my life, now I have you know uh, different ways that I can go. I have different opportunities that would be on the table that wouldn't have been there before just because I threw a ball well. Makes sense. It's not. I, it's not just the money aspect of it, man. Money's just money. I can go make money somewhere else tomorrow. I mean, that's that's not a thing to me. Well, let's. Uh... Let's end it by saying I'm proud to be partnered with you. I know there's bigger things to come in the near future. I know there is. Crystal Ball's telling me there is. We need to get together soon so we can throw down on some ruse and some gumbos and an etouffee. I need you to go to uh, the bourgeoisie uh, meat shop, maybe ship me a little care package because you missed your boy. Maybe put it in a gator cooler, ship it on down to Nevada because I'm hungry. But man, I'm excited for the future, bro. I, I wanted to be, I know you're laid back, and uh, but it's awesome to see where the brand's gone in such a short period of time. Congrats. Thank you. Appreciate that, man. You're looking very uh, Zach Brown-esque with the beard, by the way. <laughs> oh, Zach Brown. 
I need to get to a concert. Yeah. That'd be fun, wouldn't it, right now? You took them headphones off, and I'm like, man, that's, I think that is looks that, like Zach. Look, that's him right there. I'm telling Zach you. wishes he looked like that. If you're out there listening <laughs> and watching Zach. <laughs> yeah, I think Brian, the concerts are going to come back soon, man. We just got uh, we just got the phase lifted, I think. And, you know, Texas and Mississippi's taking the bands away, so uh, mask mandates are gone. So hopefully things get back to normal pretty soon. Imagine that. Imagine it just coming together that quick, huh? <laughs> we ain't even going to get into yeah. that, are we, Brian? No, not today. <laughs> All right. Y'all listen. Y'all no. listen to this. We're going to have Brian back over on our other podcast, our sister podcast, the Foul Life Podcast. And on that edition of the Foul Life Podcast, we are going to talk about a new service a new product and service that Gator is going to be offering for all of you marine boat guys, you fishing boat guys, you john boat guys, you ski boat guys. We're going to talk to Brian McGee. It's a badass product and service. I can't wait to share it with y'all. Check out Gator Coolers at Gator Coolers on Instagram. G-A-T-R-C-O-O-L-E-R-S. Gator Coolers, Louisiana, America. The McGee brothers, Brian and Mitch, they are badass American working men, family raising, blue collar citizens that had a dream and they're putting that dream into reality because of a plan a vision and execution if you can visualize it and use your visual visualization skills you can get it done we all have the ability to live the american dream it just depends on what you define the american dream as and brian and mitch mcgee are living out their american dream from oil field to coolers to networking to friends across the country, to country music artists, to actors and actresses, to politicians, to military veterans, to entrepreneurs who share their like-mindedness for success and drive and building something. That's what I think of when I think of Gator Coolers. I hope you all do too. That's another episode of This Life Ain't For Everybody for Brian McGee and Gator Coolers. Remember I said, coming up very shortly, you'll be able to listen to Brian again on our sister podcast, The Foul Life. Thank you again to Jack Daniels and Gator Coolers for presenting this episode of This Life Ain't for everybody podcast brand new episodes of the foul life tv airing july 2nd 2021 exclusively on the outdoor channel and catch all of our past seasons all 12 of them on the my outdoor tv app mo tv get a subscription right now it's inexpensive and worth every penny each month to have thousands of hours of content at your fingertips tom jake hit that button this is brian mcgee and myself's mutual friend we call him Hoss. You can call him Leith Lofton. What you going to do when the money's all gone? Written by Leith Lofton and Drake White. Y'all take care. I'd rather be poor off in a hole. Rich as hell without a soul.